never ever be the same again. In Jesus name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network. Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, all of our social media brethren online. We're so glad to welcome all of you to the service this morning. It's going to be an exciting study of God's word. We also want to welcome the Aquaibom State community connected to the service right now by way of Comfort FM, XL FM, Radio Aquaibom, Passion FM, Inspiration FM, and Heritage FM. What a joy to be able to come your way by way of radio and bring this service live right where you are. Call a friend, a family member, ask them to tune to this radio station right now. Life is flowing through the airwaves. I also want to welcome all of you, you know, that are connected around the campuses in our various communities, campuses all over the world. We're really glad to have all of you brethren connected today to the service. Um, I want to quickly mention, I got a notification yesterday from our Abuja campus. Pastor Matthew informed me yesterday that we are starting a campus this morning in Apo in Abuja. A new campus in Apo in Abuja. So for all of you that are in Abuja, you live in Abuja, or you ever find your way to Abu Abuja City over a weekend, we have a Power City Apo campus. The address is plot A7763, Mechanic Village, Apo by First Gate. Beside LFC in Apo. And those of you who want to make further inquiries in Abuja, it's uh, 070-3209-1431. If you call, you'll be given proper directions on how to locate the brethren in Apo campus. Can we celebrate the Apo brethren who have just started the campus this morning right there in the city of Abuja? Praise God. Our social media community help us share the video of this service. Put them on as many groups as possible. 50 to 100 groups. Put them on LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Telegram. Let's get the word around the world. Anybody excited about the study of God's word this morning? Can we celebrate the word with a shout? Glory! Amen! All right, grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible, and your phones. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning as we get into the word of his grace. Uh, uh, uh. All right, everybody in the house, help me share the videos, share the messages, put them on all the groups wherever you belong. It's very important. Let's get the word to the ends of the earth. That's our mandate in this new year to flood the earth with the fragrance of Jesus, his grace. Uh, uh. Amen. I said amen. This morning we are worshiping from our Enugu campus, Pastor and Mrs. Revigius Madu. We appreciate both of you. Thank you again for sharing fellowship with us. They actually came on Friday and they were in the all night prayer. And that's why they came. They just came to be in the all night prayer. People came from Enugu for all night prayer. You live in New York, you are snoring. Snoring away. Well done, you hear. I salute. <laughs> I salute. Keep sleeping. Keep sleeping. While men slept, the enemy so tears. Keep sleeping. He that loveth sleep will be poor. It's in your Bible. Keep sleeping, you hear? By the time you check, you will have slept half of your life. You will have used it for sleeping. You know, serious people don't give in to sleep. You don't give in to sleep. You sleep because you need it, not because you are a slave of sleeping. You sleep by choice. Not as a faithful duty. No, it's not, it's not work. It's not work. Am I communicating at all? Because I'm talking to some of you. You refuse to come and chill with the big boys. So you're a small boy. The people that came were chilling with the big boys. And we chill big time, isn't it? All right, so we love both of you. Thank you for coming. And they stayed back to be with us in the house on Sunday. Greet the brethren in Enugu when you get back. Let them know. We, I know they are watching. Let them know we love them. Amen. All right, are you ready? <clears throat> if you were not in the first service, I will advise you to get the message of the first service because usually I use the first service to lay some foundation that I can build upon in the second service. So if you are not here, it will help you a lot. And I know majority of you were not here in the first service. However, I'm just going to continue from where we stopped. Now, the book of Second Peter, chapter 3, verse number 15 and 16. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. 
an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Next verse. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So we've established that there was a Sophia wisdom and insight given to Brother Paul, acknowledged by Brother Peter. And we began to look at the Pauline revelation. And Peter acknowledged that the Pauline revelation is a hard to be understood. And he said, if a man is unlearned and is unstable, he will wrestle with the teachings of Brother Paul. But the good thing is that it is not impossible, it's just hard. Which means you need to put extra work to understand the Pauline theology. I also took time to say that the reason why it is so important to pay attention to the Pauline theology is because the doctrine of Brother Paul is called the doctrine of Christ. Which is what we say are the advanced teachings of Christ. What Brother Paul taught in his theology were the advanced teachings of Christ. We also took time to establish that if you look at the way Brother Paul spoke, first of all, in John chapter 16, Jesus said, I have yet many things to say unto you, 16:12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Next verse. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all the truth. He will guide you there is a Greek word that is like leading a blind man to see. So as we have established, if you read the Pauline writings in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 to 4, where brother Paul was talking about how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now you know that the scriptures refers to Genesis to Malachi. Now if you put what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and what he wrote in Romans chapter 16 verse 25. Now unto him that is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, the apocalypsis of the mysterion which was kept sigao, secret, Sigao, since the world began. Now, if you put those two scriptures together in Romans and in Corinthians with what Jesus said in Luke 24, verse 25. Luke 24, 25 to 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, verse 27. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So what Paul said and what Jesus said, you will have the same message. Because in that Luke chapter 24 verse 44, I mean 45, 44 says, These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. 45. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So we began to say that Jesus and Paul were communicating the same realities. Only that Paul had more vocabulary, more verbiage, and more expressions with more clarity to what Jesus was communicating. And we took them to establish that that is what Peter, you know, submitted to be the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. Then we began to say that the glory was explained as repentance and remission of sins will be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That's Luke 24, 47. That is the glory of his kingdom. He is the sotar. And his soteria will be found in the hearts of men. He is the sotar. And his soteria will be found in the hearts of men. A sotar is one 
who conquers a territory. He conquers a territory. Then he takes charge of his territory to preserve and to keep. So Jesus is the sota who made soteria available in the hearts of men. So the men who accept his soteria will be his conquered territory. And it is his responsibility to preserve and to keep his conquered territory. Now, it's also important to see that the way Paul explains the Old Testament books agrees with the way Jesus communicated his truths. You will find out that Jesus took time to speak a great deal on the kingdom. 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 He spoke about the kingdom. And Jesus would say things like, you know, this is what is in my kingdom. He used parables to talk about the kingdom. He said in the kingdom there is forgiveness of sins. That was Jesus' campaign. And of course Jesus would say things like the kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is like. The kingdom of God is likened unto. All the parables was Jesus campaigning about his kingdom. And then he tells them things like, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. Now, I did a lot of work on all of that foundation in the first service and it's important for you, like I said, to get the materials. In the book of Hebrews chapter 8 verse 11, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 11, the prophecy of Jeremiah he says, and they shall not teach every man his neighbor, underline the word neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. By that prophecy, Jeremiah is bringing in a family. Because the word neighbor there is the same word for citizen. Citizen is the word politis. P-O-L-I-T-E-S. And when he gets to chapter 11, he now says, Abraham desired a city whose builder and maker is God. So he used the word police, P-O-L-I-S, which is the same derivative as politis. That is, whose builder and maker is God. Which means a city, therefore, will refer to inhabitants. A collective gathering of people who belong to the same person or same place. Now, so Paul uses the word commonwealth. He uses the word citizenship a whole lot. And don't forget, Paul is a Jew and a Roman citizen. So he understands kingdom concept from the different countries where he belongs. He is explaining that you cannot have a kingdom without a people. You can't have kingdom without activity. You can't have kingdom without a culture. And you can't have kingdom without a king. So we'll look at that later. Then he begins to talk about citizenship. In Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Philippians chapter 1 verse 27. Only let your conversation, underline the word conversation, be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Now, whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Conversation there is where you have the word citizen's behavior. Citizen's behavior. Because a concept is a concept of citizenship, a concept of commonwealth. All right? So, Paul, therefore, is teaching about a country in view. Now for someone who is a Jew and is a Roman, he is teaching citizenship. A country, meaning that God is creating his own country. God is creating his own country. Then Philippians chapter 3 verse 20, Brother Paul mentions something else. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven. Did you observe? He didn't say our conversation will be in heaven. He said our conversation right now is in heaven. The word conversation is the word citizenship. Is in heaven from whence we also we look for the savior. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, our behavior, what we have, what we are, what we are constituted of. So therefore, he brings in a country. A country is a city, a people, inhabitants, and all of that. That's what constitutes a country. So therefore, in teaching his soteria, he brings in community. He brings in behavior. Community, behavior, in the teaching of his soteria. Which means there is a lifestyle. Which means there is a culture that Jesus and Paul taught. So that brings us into the concept of the kingdom. The kingdom of God. The word kingdom is the word basilia. Basilia. Jesus will say, as you go preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word basilia. Look at Mark chapter 1 verse 14. Mark chapter 1 verse 14. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The word at hand is the word egizo in the Greek, E-G-G-I-Z-O. It means the kingdom of God is approaching or the kingdom has arrived or the kingdom is imminent. John said that because the mission of John was announced that the kingdom is here or the kingdom is coming, which was Christ. Basilia in the Greek kingdom. Now, Basilia refers to a rule or a reign. It has Old Testament synonyms that we will explore. And this is John. The kingdom of heaven is here or the kingdom of heaven has come. Or the kingdom of heaven is coming. Stay with me friends. Stay with me. He is talking about the king in the kingdom. Who does he call the king? The lamb of God. Who does he call the king? I must decrease. He must increase. Who does he call the king? Whose shoes I'm not worthy to lose. I indeed baptize with water. He shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. So he's talking about a king who will operate as a lamb. If you're a Jew, you should get angry at that. He says this will take away the sins. Now Jewish people know that once you say he will take away, it means he will be killed. Jesus is talking about that kingdom. So he sends his disciples to go and preach the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. Matthew chapter 9 verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. What do you mean the gospel of the kingdom? Again, don't forget the rule and the reign of the kingdom. And the king of this kingdom is a servant. He's not a violent king. He is not a fall and die king. He is not violent. He is a servant king. A lamb that will die for his citizens. He will not kill his citizens. He will die for his citizens. Now that is antithetical because it's a direct opposite of what a Jew would have thought. And Paul is saying this is God's own kingdom. He is not Caesar's kingdom. Neither is it a man-made kingdom. It is God's own kingdom. Now, in John chapter 3, he now says to his own secret disciples, talking about Jesus, that the kind of people that comes in the inbox, you know the kind of people that come? 
They watch our videos hiding. They won't open the video so that their names don't show. They will watch it in style so we don't know they are watching. Nicodemus at night. They wait for the service to be over. They hide and watch. Because they don't want people to identify them with us. They are ashamed of what we are doing. But they are learning from it. It's not just today it started. It started with Nicodemus at night. Are you following? And then after a while they will say, you have been a great blessing to us. But when you check their Facebook page, they have never shared our video. If a man tells me I am a blessing to him, I go to his Facebook page. If I don't see my video, he's a psycho fan. I don't take him serious. Because if truly what I'm preaching is blessing you, you want to advertise it so that more people can be blessed. Except you're a psycho fan. You know, psycho fans are always around politicians. I can't bless you and you don't talk about it. Except you're a thief. When I bless you, you want everybody to know. You push it out. You play. When I ask you to put my video on your page, some of you have gone to your pages. It's useless, useless things. Women dresses, women shoes, children clothes. That's what is on your page. And you're an ambassador of Christ. You need to think. You need to think. You're ashamed of identifying with us. You are high. I know, I know. You don't know me. I go to your pages. I will type your name and go to your Facebook page and see what is there. All of you. As I'm looking at you now, I know what is on your pages. Am I not your pastor? How can I pastor you and I'm not, I'm not moving around? Part of pastoring is to move around and see what your sheep are feeding on. So, because I'm here to, with a rod and a staff. They are not for eating yam. The rod and the staff is for direction and for smacking. Stop that. Pa, pa, stop that. Look. Behave well. Don't you never say, are you the one we're talking about? Nick at night. You watch me privately. Private followers. <laughs> say, you've been a blessing to me. You are a joke. Well, John said to, I mean, Jesus said to, to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. Except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter. John 3.3, 3, John 3.5. And here we go in explaining that. Now you will see the mix of God and the mix of heaven used. Please pay attention. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Someone said that the kingdom of heaven is in the kingdom of God. Calm down. Please be calming down. So you don't confuse yourself. It's like saying Christ, the son of the living God. He is Christ on Monday and the son of the living God on Tuesday. That's uncharitable. If he's Christ on Monday, he should be Christ on Tuesday. So it's just one of the same thing. Kingdom of God is kingdom of heaven. They are not two different things. Or like someone, you know, insinuated that if Dr. Damina understands the difference between heaven and heavenly, his doctrine will change. And when I checked his bio, I discovered I was preaching for over 10 years before he was born to this earth. I've been preaching for over 10 years before his mother and father decided to produce him. And he's telling me that if I understand the difference between heaven and heavenly, my doctrine will change. You know, children of this generation don't know that when you respect elders, you live long. They don't know that. They don't know that. That's why a lot of them, they just die carelessly. They don't know that. <laughs> they don't know that. The Bible says, when you see an elderly man, you shall stand up. It's in your Bible. That when you see an elderly man, 
you shall stand up. It's insinuating respect. Respect. You can disagree with me respectfully. Because I, 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 I can burn you. I can burn you. Ten years into my preaching, Jemima was already on ground. So I can burn you. If you can't talk to your father like that, don't try it around. He doesn't even know the meaning of heaven. Say, if I know heaven and heavenly, my doctrine will change. Meanwhile, heaven and heavenly is the same thing. They are the same. They don't mean two different things. Heaven, heavenly, they are the same. They are not two different things. Maybe he went to one school somewhere. And sometimes I like to answer them because the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly. It's not everybody you keep quiet for. They answer him according to his foolishness. Heaven, heavenly, heavenly is the same. It means the same thing. They are not different things. Now let's see something. He's talking to Nicodemus and he says, except a man be born again. And I think Genoa in the Greek. That which is born of flesh is flesh and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So Nicodemus is wondering, what is Jesus talking about? Now, you just mentioned kingdom. Cannot see the kingdom. Cannot enter the kingdom. Which means a kingdom must have a king. A kingdom must have a ruler who reigns. Then he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of God be lifted up. Then he says, whosoever believes in him, the word pistis or the word pistio in the Greek, faith or belief, should not perish, but have eternal life. Then he now says in verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So this king is a servant. This king is a prize to be paid. This king is a gift of God's love. He's a servant. He's a prize to be paid. He's a gift of God's love. So Matthew 20, and I'm going to go into some very deep stuff. Please pay attention. Having been interested in Jesus' healing ministry and all the disciples are used to the fact that he calmed the storm, he raised the dead, he multiplied bread and fishes. If you were one of Jesus' associates, you should start having plans to marry. If you are among his disciples. Because it was fantastic. A man is blind, he opens his eye. People are hungry, he takes bread and fish. 5,000 people are fed, you know, performing miracles all over the place. If you're following such a man, you should plan to marry. You should plan to own a house. You should plan to buy cars. He's doing miracles for people he doesn't even know. <laughs> He's just distributing things all over the place. You should have an impression that this guy is very rich. Am I teaching good? He must have told his wife, or you should be able to tell your wife, this man we're following, we can never be poor. This man is something else. And if that kind of discussion is in your mind, then one day, James and John's mother comes to church and wants to see Jesus. And the mother kneels down and says to Jesus, I am so blessed. I have a request, sir. Because of how much you have blessed us. Oh, what a blessing you are. Can you grant that one of my sons be on your left hand and the other one on your right? They are so carried away by the miracles of Jesus. They don't even know what the kingdom is. So Jesus says to the mother, do you even know what you're asking for? He tells them, you can't even dare the kind of cup I am going to drink. 
Do you know what you're asking for? I'm sure the mother will say cup. No be cup. You won't drink inside the cup. We can all drink inside. <laughs> Jesus' way of talking. He calls death a cup I will drink from. Now, if you don't understand, you will start doing cup service. Are you following? What kind of service? Cup service. You bring a big cup, you will drink of his cup. Or you open your mouth. You have drunk by feet. Open your mouth. So everybody will come and drink from the cup. Meanwhile, it was a figure of speech. Just like Jesus using water to wash the feet of his disciples. And many churches are washing legs. Meanwhile, it was a communication that I will be the sacrifice that will wash your sins. So now he says, can you drink of the cup that I will drink? Cup? Yes, now. We they drink from cup now. Now pot we go drink from before. <laughs> Have we got to drink from pot before? It's from cup. <laughs> Matthew 20, 22. <laughs> Matthew 20, 22. But Jesus answered and said, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized of, um, with? They said unto him, we are able, no be cup, we will drink baptism. Not be jump inside river. We will jump inside. Somebody say Jesus. You see his, his way of talking. Now, observe. As soon as he says that, others had it. Maybe the mother asked privately. Then Jesus answered publicly in the presence of the other disciples. So they now had it. Look at verse 24 of Matthew 20. Matthew 20. And when the ten had it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. You know why they were angry? Because all of them too wanted the position. So it is not just the murder. It must have been a plan. Everybody was planning. Who will sit on the right? Who will sit on the left? You know, very interesting. Next verse. Give me the next verse. Verse number 25. But Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority over them. That's the way the, the, the government of this world functions. Alright? So he, he now removes that mentality from their mind. Then Jesus now comes up with the Genesis account. Alright? Look at verse 26. But... It shall not be so among you. Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. Let him be your servant. Because the king of the kingdom is a servant. Therefore, all the subjects in the kingdom ought to be servants. Whoever will be great among you, let him be your servant. What do you mean by that? I'm sure they must have told Jesus. Go and read your Bible. Solomon was a king and he had servants. But he was the king. What about David? David was the king of Israel. And he ruled. And reigned. Jesus, go and read your Bible. Then he says, no. Not as the Gentiles. In my kingdom, you have to be a servant. Then he says, just like the son of man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. The word diconia and the word luterion, a serving sota, a serving savior. You know, Jesus is still serving us even now. He is still serving us till now because he's a serving sota. He is giving so he brings up the narrative of the Passover. The water, the washing of their feet, everything he thought was about him giving. As a shepherd, he gives his life. As a Passover lamb, he gives his body and he gives his blood. He washes them with himself. He now says his water is his spirit. Except a man be born again. So that means there will be a new birth 
for this kingdom. And this new birth will come about by the sacrifice of the king. The new birth in this kingdom or to be born a citizen in this kingdom will come about by the sacrifice of the king of this kingdom. Who is the lamb? Who is the Messiah? The Sota and the Lutheran. So he takes on the image mentioning the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Which Jesus talked about very often in his parables. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we have been so much disconnected from what he was saying in our minds. So that when you mention heaven today, people talk about dying. Dying. But Jesus didn't say so. Again, we will look at the Pauline truth and see what Jesus thought. You know, listen everybody, the, the aspect of somebody dying and going to heaven is nowhere in the Bible. That somebody died and went to heaven is not a Bible truth. It's nowhere. You won't find it anywhere. Nobody wrote that so and so died and went to heaven. It's not in the Bible. It's not a scriptural truth. But you know today, if somebody should die, you go to counsel the family after the death. <laughs> and you say he didn't go to heaven. <laughs> you should be standing at the exit door when saying it because of what will follow you. <laughs> so if you go to where they have, they have buried somewhere and you want to console them and they are saying he's gone to heaven, you just say yes. Yes, we thank God. Amen. But you know better. <laughs> so that you can be alive. <laughs> now Jesus, are you in the building? Jesus uses the Genesis narrative beginning at all right, Genesis. He uses the Genesis narrative we make man in our image. The man. Moses was careful to use the word humanity. When he uses the word Adam, Adama, Adama, dear, in our image, the word Selem, T S E L E M, Selem, T S E L E M. The transliteration of the word Selem is the word Akon, E I K O N, Akon, which means image. And that word image or Selem used severally by Paul. The word image means to print yourself in another. To print yourself in another. So by using the word selem, it's an expression of one in the other person. An expression of one in the other person. To print yourself in another image. I was walking somewhere in America with mama and the girls, and then somebody walked to jail. My third daughter and said, nobody is stealing your father from you. <laughs> nobody is stealing your father from you. Then the person looked and said, looks exactly like the father. Why? Because they could see my print on her. Splitting image. Image means I printed myself on you. So when they see us, no difference. It's like the identical twins that came to our house. Two of them came exactly the same. And two of them were smiling. <laughs> One of them is a staff in our office. His brother came and they came to my house. <laughs> Confusion. I mean, exactly. Even the smile. And they were all smiling. So now I don't know which is our staff. And they were feeling good. That they are confusing me. <laughs> Why are you confusing me? <laughs> Mama said, honey. I said, uh. <laughs> then NS, NS now said, which one is our staff? I went and pointed the wrong one. 
Even word of knowledge didn't work at that time. <laughs> Both of them, you can't tell the difference. Then in out, one of them now said to us that their, their sisters too are identical twins. What a family. The children will just be confusing the parents. This one will go and do a bad thing. You won't know which one to touch. The girls too, this one will touch the wrong thing. The father will say, which of you? Which of you? Two of them will say, we don't know. Which of you? And you don't know what to do with such children. <laughs> Splitting image. So when he says, let us make man in our image, he was actually talking about printing, printing himself in another. In our image, that's the God man. The God man. Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. Look at the way brother Paul now takes that and expands it in Second Corinthians 4 4. In whom the God of the world or this world have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. Christ is the image of God. So when Moses says, and God said, let us make man in our image. Paul took the theology from Moses and advanced the explanation that the image God was talking about was Christ, the image of God. So the man in Genesis 1.26 is Christ. And you can see that the, that the exact opposite of the image of God will be idolatry. That's the exact opposite. Idolatry. Images formed by man. Images that God didn't form. Idolatry. Images formed by man. Look at that Second Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 again and 5. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Second Corinthians 4, 4, and 5. In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Next verse. Who is the image of God? For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Next verse. Oh, but for God... Who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Christ, the image of God. He brings in the Genesis account of light out of darkness. And he calls that image Christ. The earth was without form, void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God, Ruach, the Ruach of God moved in darkness. And God said, let there be light. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. That light that shone out of darkness has shone in our hearts. So that light in Genesis 1-3 is Christ. Which means the first thing the Bible opens up with is the salvation plan of God. That in the midst of man's darkness without God, then God commanded light to shine out of darkness. Christ be in the darkness of man. Christ the man. That's the Christology of scripture. That's how the scriptures open up. With Christology. Now, who is the image of God should shine in their hearts. That's the same word brother Paul used in Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Mm -mm, pay attention. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? So when you go back to Genesis account and God speaks to Adam as it were humanity to dominate. 
Now we will see that. Let them have dominion tomorrow or so. God never created human domination of the other person. No. God has never given man the power to dominate the other. That's not God. That's not God. God gave man dominion over things, not over people. God gave man dominion over things, not over people. I will tell you when that, you know, when that started. We will look at it in this series. The word rule, rada in the Hebrew, which is the same as basileo, is to rule over things, not man. But that plan of God has been distorted. So men are ruling men. Men are dominating men. Husbands are dominating their wives. Intimidating their wives and harassing their wives. In some homes, the wife dare not talk when the husband is talking. Otherwise, she will be ministered to massively after the encounter. She will be ministered to it in the absence of witnesses. Which is not right. Which is not right. You married in love. Why are you using intimidation now to keep the marriage? You married in love. You should use love to keep the marriage. Not intimidation. Not harassment. Not domination. Always putting your wife down. Always subduing her. Always harassing her. That's witchcraft. I'm serious. It's witchcraft. Or a wife always putting the husband down. A stupid man. Idiot. I know that marrying you was, was admission into suffering nonsensical man. The man will say, I will show you. The wife will say, you remember the last time how I beat you? Try it. Yet those two people met on the platform of love. Laughter and everything. Now they have turned the tables. It ought not so to be. Think about it. Think about it. It's chaos. It's disorder. In the kingdom of God, what is taught is dominion over things, not over people. So Jesus brings in the concept of heaven and earth. We are that concept, please pay a beg of you. That concept of heaven and earth, in Genesis, heaven and earth were together. They were together. That's how it was in Genesis. Heaven and earth, you will not find a distinction. And that remains the way Jesus taught it. Whereas we teach heaven as a planet different from the earth, that's not how Jesus taught it. Jesus taught heaven as a control room in the earth activities. That's the way Jesus taught heaven. A control room in the earth activities. Heaven is not a planet. There's a song we used to sing and I was a good singer of that song. I am going higher, yes I am. I am going higher someday. I am going higher, yes I am. Going with Jesus to stay. I am going above the shadows into the presence of God. Into the presence of Jesus. 
I am going higher someday. Hallelujah. I am going. You remember I used to sing it very well. I was praise worship leader in my father's church. And every Sunday I'm leading praise and worship. The whole church is rejoicing. The whole place will catch fire. You will see people rejoicing. I'm going higher someday. I'm going higher. Yes, I have glory. Going with Jesus to stay. You can never find truth in a lie. That song is a lie. That song is a lie. And yet people sang it and cried. With tears. And movement of the spirit. Emotions. Eh? If you follow emotions, you will die young. Higher into the presence of, so right now, no presence of Jesus. It is when you go higher, above the shadows. He's talking about the physical atmospheric heaven. Jesus never taught that. No apostle taught that. And it's not a doctrine in the Torah, in the Old Testament. So picture heaven as a control room within the earth. A control room. Please, you better renew your mind though. Because what I have started, I'm not backing out till you catch it. Remove your religious beret. Heaven is a control room within the earth. The only difference is that it is unseen. The only difference is that it is unseen. So he talks about his resurrection. And in his resurrection he says, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of the hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The Basileo of heaven. Basileo Horanus. And whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is lose in heaven. That shows the control of things is in heaven. The unseen with the seen. The unseen with the seen. And that's how Jesus taught it. And that's how the apostles taught it. He's saying to you that when anybody is born into the kingdom, he is born into heaven. The moment you are born into the kingdom, that is the day you entered heaven. Heaven at last is not Bible. It's heretic. There's nothing like heaven at last. Heaven's reality is what you encountered the day Christ entered. Any heaven outside Jesus, I don't want to go. Any heaven outside Jesus, I don't want to go. So which shows that he's saying to you that when anybody is born in the kingdom, he is born in heaven. He is born with authority. He is born in the control room. Eh? Everybody say, I am in the control room of heaven over the earth. You are not translating to heaven. Honey, do you know that that song is not even in the Bible? It's not Bible based. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We are not marching to. We are come. Did you go to school? There's a difference between marching to and come. We are not marching to Zion. You need to renew your mind. We are come to Zion. We are not coming.
I have a lot of work here. Now, the believer is born in the control room. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven because it is heavenly. Kingdom of God because it is of God. You do get that? Kingdom of heaven because it is heavenly. Kingdom of God because it is of God. They, they are both experiences of God's rule and reign in the earth. They are both experiences of God's rule and reign in the earth. So Paul teaches it that same way. And when you see Paul use the word heaven, look at how Paul uses it. Paul uses the word heaven the same way Jesus used it. Consistency of theology. Jesus said, the new birth is born into the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. That's what he calls it. And Paul in Romans 1.18 talks about heaven. Put it up for me. Romans 1.18, brother Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Revealed from heaven. Then he mentions in Romans 10.6. Who shall ascend to heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Quoting from Deuteronomy 30. I mean Deuteronomy 30. Then in 1 Corinthians 8, 5, he talks about lords in heaven and lords on earth. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, 47, he talks about the Lord, 15, 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy, the second man is the Lord from heaven. Please take note of brother Paul's use of heaven. It will agree with what Jesus taught. 2 Corinthians 5, 2, he talks about our body. 2 Corinthians, for in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Brother Paul's vision. 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell. Or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knew it. Such a one caught up to the third heaven caught up to the third that word third heaven is a Jewish idiom it's an idiomic expression third heaven but do you know that Paul was caught to the third heaven but he was still inside the room where he was it was not a change of location it's not a change of location Okay? Caught to the third heaven. Stay with me. In Galatians 1.8, Brother Paul said, Though we are an angel from heaven. An angel from heaven. Again, used to describe unknown earthly activity. Unknown angel from heaven. It's a physical activity. Now, look at the key text to understand Paul's teaching on heaven will be Ephesians 1.10 and Philippians 2.10. Ephesians 1.10 and Philippians 2.10. The two of them bring in the Christ hermeneutics on the subject of heaven. If you know very well in the temple that Moses built, there was a figure of heaven in that temple. And I will talk about that figure later. But like I said, the temple was supposed to be the meeting place of heaven and earth. The temple was supposed to be the meeting place of heaven and earth. And so that's how it was designed. Heavenly things. 
Then in the epistles, that heavenly reality is now found in man. That heavenly reality is now found in man as it were God's heaven. So Ephesians 1.10, put it up. Ephesians 1.10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ. Observe. Both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So heaven and earth in Christ. Heaven and earth in Christ. Now it's a terrible old translation. The word things there is the Greek word ho, H-O. It means being. He's not talking about material things, but persons. Because by the time you get to chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, it now gets clear. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, next verse, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. In heaven and earth is named. That is, this family is where? In heaven. That is in the earth. The family is in heaven. Heaven located on earth. The family is in the control room. The control room located on earth. Zibado Bosch. So heaven is in the earth. The whole family in heaven is right here on earth. He may gather heaven and earth in Christ. Zibadosh. So the family is in heaven and is here on earth. That is, this is the family in heaven. And that family in heaven is found here on earth. Look at Philippians 2.10. Teaching good? Philippians 2.10. Oh, that at the name of Jesus, not at the mention. At the mention of the name. <laughs> at the mention of the name. When they want to do small gyration and exercise in the church. A dimension of the name. That's a lie. And you can't get truth out of a lie. It's not a dimension. It's at the name. There are two different things. That song distorts the scripture. It insults the sensibility of the Pauline theology. It's an insult on the Torah. The sacred scriptures. As little as that mention is there, it has spoiled everything. You don't need a bucket of heresy. You just need a little dot. At the name of Jesus, put it up. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth. And things under the earth. He talks about at the name of Jesus. Every knee must bow. Things in heaven. And things on earth. And every tongue. Meaning man. Man. Tongue. So the things in heaven and earth. Is man. Beings. Beings. So man is who he is in heaven. Which means man is the focus of heaven. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our behavioral pattern. 
how we live our lives is in heaven. Watch this. If you're writing, take note of this. 2 Corinthians 5 1, Ephesians 4 10. Notice when you read it that Paul uses the word heaven. Paul uses the word heaven to describe our activity, our authority, our nature, our inheritance. <laughs> Paul uses that word heaven as a description of our authority, our activity, our nature, our inheritance. In Colossians, take note, chapter 1 verse 5, chapter 1 verse 16, chapter 1 verse 20, chapter 1 verse 23, Colossians, and Colossians chapter 4 verse 5. All of those scriptures refers to a control room different from the earthly things. So whenever he talks about the kingdom of heaven or heaven, he uses it as the opposite of the earthly realm, the earthly rule, or an earthly reign. It's not a planet. It is the exact opposite of a Caesar or a Roman Empire. Just like we said the Sota. That is what God has done in the earth. What God has done in the earth is called heaven. Or is called heavenly. What God has done on the earth is called heaven. Or is called heavenly. Glory to God. I tell you, religion is in trouble now. So what God has done in the earth, he uses that expression called heaven. Take note of this. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 6 1 Thessalonians Chapter 1 verse 7. He uses it as to what God is doing or what God will do. So when you say heaven, you are talking about God's control room in the church. God, God's control room in the church. Sitting in the heavenly places, just like heaven. Sitting in the heavenly places, we are sitting there. Heaven on earth. Heaven is not a planet. Heaven is in the earth. It is God's control room in the church. It's God's control place in the body of Christ. Heaven is God's control center in the believer. Oh. oh, oh. <laughs> hey. It's not a planet. That's why they said the kingdom of God is here. The basilia of God is here. Luke 17, 20. Look at Jesus. Hey, bo, da, da, da. Let's enter Jesus. We have done Paul. Let's enter Jesus. Then we shall combine Paul and Jesus and look at them hand in hand. Because there must be consistency of theology. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Next verse. Who? Neither shall they say, Lo, here, or Lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is inside you. Heaven is inside you. 
You are the carrier of heaven. God's control room in the earth. We are not going to heaven. We house heaven right now. Am I talking to somebody here? The Old Testament said, God has planted eternity where? In our... We are not going to heaven. We are citizens of heaven. Heaven is in the believer as God's control center on the earth. Am I teaching good? Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Don't go anywhere. Stay with me. John 3.13. Jesus was talking. John 3 13. And no man had ascended up to heaven. That's why you don't see where the Bible says he died and went to heaven. It's not theology, it's not Bible. All this, our brother has died, he has gone to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Nobody taught it. Brother Paul will put it like this. To be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. Christ in. When the believer drops his body, he's still where he is in Christ. He doesn't travel. He only dropped the sin to remain in the unseen where he is. In the kingdom, the basilia of God. Please stay with me. All of this Christianity of traveling somewhere is another gospel. It's not the gospel of Christ. It has no Bible to explain it. <laughs> there is no Bible to explain it. Yakuna. If but he that came down from heaven, even the son of man, honey, which is where? Wait, wait. Zekuna na nakuta labaha. Jaquanha. Why are you looking at me? Don't you have your own tongues? Even the son of man. Which is where? You know what Jesus is saying? I came out of heaven. But even as I am walking here, I am still in heaven. It's not a travel. I came out of heaven and I am still in heaven. Now, this is Jesus teaching you. It's not some boy somewhere. And you can see that what Jesus is teaching here is exactly what Paul was explaining. Is that true? Consistency of theology. Now, look at Jesus' description. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. Then he says, I am the bread from heaven. I am the bread. Or heavenly. Basically. So always renew your mind with the concept of Jesus and the concept of Paul on heaven. In the book of Acts, the word heaven is used 24 times. In the four gospels, it is used 140 times. About 112 of the usage refers to as God. Now, look at the writer of Hebrews, how he presents this 
in such beauty. Hebrews 9.24 For Christ, please pay attention, is not entered into the holy places made with hands which are a figure of the true but into heaven itself now to appear where? Help me everybody. Let's read the last line together. Now I want to go to appear where? For? So who did he appear in the presence of God for? So his appearance in the presence of God, who is the beneficiary? So are you going to benefit from outside or from inside? So if he appeared in the presence of God for you, it means the presence of God will be where you are. See, the presence of God won't be there and you are here and the appearance is for you. If the appearance is for you, as he's appearing for you, you should be where he's appearing to benefit from the appearance. Yes. Yes. So which means the presence of God for us, where Jesus appeared... I and my father will come into you and make our abode in you. So when Jesus rose with the blood, he didn't go to a planet. He came with it into your heart. Where is the blood needed? In a planet or in the sinner? Who is the blood for? Who is the blood used for? God doesn't need the blood. God is not a sinner. It is the sinner that the blood will be brought to. To wash him. So Jesus went into heaven itself. Into heaven itself. He rose and entered man. So the blood can carry out the work. So man is God's heaven. Man is God's heaven. You know, that's a concept of atonement that has not been well distilled. There's this communication where they say Jesus died and took the offering to God. As if it was God that demanded the sacrifice. As if God was the kidnapper. After God kidnapped you, then he now started shouting, I want blood. I want blood. If I will free man, I want blood. Then when God said, I want blood, blood will be dripping out of his every side of his body. Blood. His teeth is as red as Dracula. I want blood. I feed on blood. Vampire. That's the impression of the God they give to you. When you pray, fall and die, you're saying God is a vampire who feasts on human bodies and blood. It's an insult. It's an abuse on the knowledge of Christ. That's why I took time in Soteria 6. And I dealt with to whom was the price of sin paid. I taught it for 35 hours. Because I needed to settle that matter. That God is not the one demanding blood. God doesn't need blood. God is the one offering the blood. To free the sinner from the kidnapper. Who kidnapped man? Sin. The wages of sin is what? Death. Sin entered man, sin kidnapped man, and sin demanded death. So God offered sin its demand and freed man from sin. And once the blood was offered to sin, Jesus rose and entered the captive and freed the captive because he came for conquest. He came for what? Conquest. 
after he conquered the territory, he secured it and lives inside because that is his territory. So man becomes the kingdom of God. If I'm teaching, shout, I hear, I hear. Man is the kingdom of his love. Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. Righteousness, peace, and joy. That's so where is righteousness? In you. Where is peace? In you. Where is joy? In you. Where is Holy Ghost? In you. That is. So where is the kingdom of God? So where does God dwell? Where is God's authority? Where is God's activity? Where is God's control? So where is God's heaven? Man is God's heaven. Ah, heaven is in my heart. Ah, heaven is in my heart. You know that one. Sit down, sit down. So give me a few minutes, I'll soon finish. If you understand the shout, I hear you. This thing is doing me. Once you say the blood was offered to God, you have changed the entire narrative of the four gospels. Because Jesus taught that God is the one offering Jesus. So how will he be, be the one offering and the one collecting? All you know is like that guy who kidnapped himself and called the family to bring ransom. A husband kidnapped himself because the wife has a lot of money and the wife is not giving him money. So he arranged people to kidnap him and chain him and send pictures of his chains to the wife demanding ransom. And the wife sent the ransom. And the husband was freed by the husband. Later on, the wife discovered it was an arrangement. Money. People can do anything for money. God didn't kidnap you and paid himself to free you. Does it make sense? Is he playing? You think Jesus is a small boy? No, no, no. I'm calling small boy. I didn't say you should sing it too. <laughs> That's not big man. <laughs> Religion is not a good thing. <laughs> this concept has to be well distilled. But the writer of Hebrews explains it to us in a way we shouldn't miss it. Let me take this short, then I round up. This is the same writer in Hebrews 10.34. Put it up for me. Hebrews 10.34. He uses the word heavenly substance and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Then in Hebrews eleven sixteen, he talks about a heavenly country. Hebrews eleven sixteen. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. We are for God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared for them a city. Heavenly country. Hebrews 12, 22. Hebrews 12, 22. But you are come unto Mount Zion. What is Mount Zion? The city of the living God. What is the city of the living God? The heavenly Jerusalem. And to an innumerable company of angels. You are already come. It's not a prayer of heaven at last. That's where you are now. Then it says in verse 23. Of that Hebrews. To the general assembly. So the, the occupants of that thing called heaven. Are the firstborn. The church which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, 
and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That is not a planet. It's not a planet. Look at verse 24. He's not talking about a planet. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. He's talking about things on earth. He's talking about men and women. He's talking about saints of God. And he says they are in heaven. And then he says you are come to eat. James uses the word heaven twice. Peter uses the word heaven a bit. And you can write this down. 1 Peter 1.14 1 Peter 1.12 1 Peter 3.22 1 Peter 1.14, 1 Peter 1.12, 1 Peter 3.22, about the resurrection of Jesus. And then 2 Peter 1.18, 2 Peter 3.5, 2 Peter 3.7, 2 Peter 3.10, Second Peter 3.12 and 3.13. 3.12 and 3.13. Let, let's look at the book of Hebrews. Sorry, book of Revelation. Revelation has heaven 56 times. And you ought to know why. 56 times. Now in Hebrews 1.10, the writer of Hebrew uses the term heaven. Put it up, Hebrews 1.10. And thou Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hand. He's talking about the physical, the atmospheric heaven, not the spiritual reality. Hebrews 3.1, look at the way he calls heaven, the writer of Hebrews. Hebrews 3.1. We are for holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. He calls salvation a heavenly calling. Hebrews 4.14 He makes an appeal. Let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Pass into the church. The heavens means he is passed into the church. Into the house of God. What is called the temple. Not into the atmosphere. Into the church. Into the church. He is passed into the church. Into the church. Can I explain? Destroy this temple. Okay, before destroy this temple, I will build my church. I will build my ecclesia. So the building will be his own. That is, I will build my house. I will build where I will live. And when I build it, the gates of hell cannot prevail. Destroy this house. And in three days, I will raise the permanent one. This he spoke of his death. So when he rose, he built his heaven. And his heaven is the born again man. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the born again man. Because the born again man is a product of his resurrection. Look at Hebrews 7.26. I'm teaching good man. Hebrews 7.26. For such an high priest became us. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And made higher than the heavens. Are made higher than the heavens. 
Heaven here is used physically. But look at Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2. Now, of the things which we have spoken, this is the summary. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty where? In the heaven. Next verse. A minister of what? So the heaven is the sanctuary. And of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man, destroy this temple. I will raise it up. The true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. And you are that tabernacle. You are that tabernacle. So he calls the temple of God today or the house of God heaven. So Jesus' heaven is Paul's church or Paul's kingdom. Is the word Oranios. Oranios. O U R A N I O S. But to understand the use of this term is that which explains what is there. And we're going to brutally look at that tomorrow evening. Another word is euphoronious. E-P-O-R-U-A E-P-O-R-U-A N-I-O-S Where you have the word heavenly. So Paul uses this more and it is not far-fetched because Paul is writing to the church. So he will use this euphorinous or the realm of heaven or the things of heaven. Euphorinous. That word euphorinous means heaven, heavenly, heavenly. It's all the same. Euphorinous. And that is how Paul uses the term heaven. Don't forget again as I round up to close. That Jesus' use of heaven and Paul's use of heaven is to show a control room on the earth. So what happens in a place or what rules or controls a place? What rules or controls a place? So listen, the death of Jesus is heavenly. Eternal life is heavenly. Forgiveness of sin is heavenly. <laughs> there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are aware. So no condemnation is heavenly. Don't forget, heaven remains the control room on the earth. The control room. Say with me very loud, I am in heaven now. In Christ. Say it again, I am in heaven right now. In Christ. Now say with me, I am in heaven now forever in Christ. So to me, I am born into heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven. I belong to the control room of God in heaven, in Christ, in me right now. Right now. Not tomorrow. Right now. That's where you are. Blessed? I said blessed? Get on your feet. Let's close this up. Zibola tatatas. Echo manangle de bosha. Everybody look at me. Say with me right now in the name of Jesus. I function from the control room of the earth. It is called heaven. Tell your neighbor if you are looking for heaven. 
I'm standing by you. Say, I'm heaven on earth. I'm a custodian of God's abode on the earth. I didn't hear a good amen. amen. Lift your right hands. Father, I pray for everybody in this service, those online, those in our campuses, those on radio, everyone hearing the sound of my voice, that this reality will resonate in your understanding in the name of Jesus. Barriers terminated. Obstacles terminated. Whatever is not planted by God is rooted out. The control room of the earth is inside you. So whatever does not look like Jesus, flushed out. Flushed out. Flushed out. Your body be well. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. Revelation knowledge grows big in this house until nothing else matters. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Can Jesus' is heaven rejoice? Can I hear a heavenly rejoicing from heavenly citizens? Where are the citizens of heaven? Rejoice again, I say rejoice. Somebody shout glory. Amen. Grab your offerings. Let's give in honor of what Christ has done. And listen carefully, those of you online, listen carefully. Today is Partnership Sunday. And in a few minutes, I'm going to pray for all the partners. And I want to thank all of you who are partners of this ministry. Continually give to help us give expression to this mandate and assignment of reintroducing Jesus to this generation. And I want to thank all of you that partner with us. And as you redeem your commitments, we've already spoken the blessing over you. You continue to excel as you make more money to fulfill God's plan on the earth. Let me also mention today, we're giving opportunity to people, especially those of you in the building online on television, who have not had the opportunity to make a commitment towards our $100,000 offering that we are raising for the first project of the new year. If you've not been able to do, you want to do that today, you still have the opportunity, you have between and the end of January, to redeem your commitment. Remember, people gave to enable us to get the gospel to where you are. If you also support us, we'll get the gospel to more people. That's the whole idea. So if you want to give to us a $100,000 offering, maybe you want to give $50,000, $100,000, or you want to give us ten or $5,000 or $1,000 or $500, according to your ability, all you need to do today is send me a mail, Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com, Drabel Damina, and we will send you a response with the right account to send your money to. And we want to thank you for responding to give. Also, today's partnership, the banking details are on the screen where you can redeem your partnership commitments. Thank you again for partnering with us and making your monies available so we can get the goodness of God to the people for whom he died. Lift up your honor offerings. Father, we rejoice that we give in honor, we give in faith all over the world, our campuses. Everyone connected to this ministry is giving today. We are grateful that you gave us the opportunity to make a difference to our giving. So I decree that as we give, our offerings are a sweet smell before you. And we thank you for the privilege to do this today. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a big amen. amen. Now, radio audience, don't go. Ask the counselor. We'll come for a few minutes before you are wrapped up. But all the others, remember, we're live tomorrow. At 6 p.m. GMT plus one as I keep teaching. But don't forget our fast continues this evening. Prayers will be live at 7 to 8. And then of course the teaching continues at 9 to 10. And prayer continues at 10 to 11. We break the fast tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. till 6. And then we continue the fast again tomorrow evening as we gather here to continue teaching the in Christ realities. Amen. And we'll be signing the online community in another two or three minutes. But everybody, you know, we love you and we thank you for honoring this ministry with your givings all the time. Can we celebrate viewers around the world for